So uh, today you have uh, you have already heard the uh, excellent opening remark from uh, Christian and uh, Rosalinde. I hope you are very much pumped for uh, this uh, info day, and uh, uh, you will uh, get further information afterwards and uh, from uh, our executive director Carlo Borghini. Uh, you will continue, Carlo, introducing you what uh, are the uh, core conditions of this uh, call for proposal 2022. And I will also uh, explain to you uh, the program approach and how to navigate across the different documents. After that, we will have a coffee break between uh, 10 and 10 15. And uh, uh, you will, we will get into the heart of the uh, destination, so of the topics. Uh, that we have uh, uh, launched and we will open, uh, we, when we have already opened with this first call uh, from the different uh, program manager of the Europe Trade Joint Undertaking. Uh, we will have, uh, you will have the possibility to ask questions. Please do that uh, in the chat itself. We will monitor the chat and we will answer orally. And as I have explained before, the meeting is registered, so uh, also the answer will be available afterwards on our website through uh, the video. We will have a lunch break uh, of uh, uh, about one hour uh, between 11.45 and 12.45, and then we will restart the session in the afternoon. So it's a long day, but I think it will worth it uh, to um, explain to you what are the legal and uh, financial guidelines. So uh, my colleague uh, uh, Vincent will explain to you uh, the different uh, financial uh, part uh, of uh, the submission of the project proposal. And uh, Valérie will also explain what are uh, the grant uh, uh, um, specificities that you need to take into account in terms of participation. You will also have their possibility to ask a question and answer. And uh, uh, the day will be ending at uh, around uh, uh, 1500. So without further ado, I would uh, suggest to go back on the on, on the uh, visualization without a presentation and uh, give the floor to Carlo for his introduction. Perfect. Good morning. Thank you very much, Giorgio, for uh... Uh, your introduction, but especially thank you very much to Christian Schmidt and uh, Rosalinde uh, for their introduction and presentation. It's really fundamental because effectively uh, the Europe's uh, uh, rail joint undertaking is part of the uh, European Union as institution. Uh, and in this respect, uh, the policy uh, importance uh, and the introduction of the policy by the Commission uh, drive the, the, the future works that uh, we need to do uh, in Europe's rail together with the sector. And this is the reason why today we are re really together, because it's the first opportunity uh, to start our journey uh, with a major investment uh, of public money. We are putting on the table 234 million euros. I think uh, we will go into the details later on. But fundamentally, the, the, the message is we want to see the European rail system transformed in the next four or five years in order to be able afterwards to start uh, to deploy the solution uh, and have the correct legal and regulatory framework uh, into which to do such type of deployment. Um, I will start uh, with uh, the presentation. I, uh, Giorgio, are you sharing the presentation? Yeah, perfect, good. So while Giorgio is uh, showing the slides, uh, we start from uh, what is the, the vision and the mission of uh, Europe's rail? Uh, as we, uh, as both uh, Christian and Rosalinda have mentioned, um, we are working to support the goals of the European Union to become the first uh, neutral continent from the carbon footprint. Uh, uh, and it's a major uh, objective that uh, we believe a rail uh, uh, is paramount to contribute to such type of transformation. And how we do it is delivering uh, with a system approach, and we will go through it uh, uh, after in the different slides. Giorgio will present the structure of the program in this respect. Uh, high capacity, so more train on the existing network and also filling the gaps where trains are not there. Flexible, be capable to uh, have a tactical approach in terms of traffic management and capacity management. Multimodal, the rail should be fully integrated in the uh, um, transport and mobility system of Europe. 
sustainable because rail is already today the greenest mode of transport unless you walk or bike. Uh, and in this respect, we have also the duty to look how we can improve our carbon footprint, how we can improve our sustainability. But sustainability is going beyond, is also a socio-economic sustainability. Reliable, because we have experienced the impact of the climate change already today, what happened in last summer, for example, in some part of Europe, and it should be integrated. We have targeting one European rail network. We need to connect the continent, the European Union member states, in order to transport people and goods uh, through the countries. Many times I've been told when I joined rail, rail is a national, uh, largely uh, system, because in terms of passengers, it's national. But 40% of the European population lives near to the borders, so are commuting between countries. So it's not so national. The, the impact of our life on our life of commuting is a fundamental component of the transformation of rail system. And at the end, we want to bring down the barriers, introduce solutions uh, that are providing uh, a full integration of the system for the citizen and for the uh, cargo. And clearly, what we want to do, to do we, we want to ensure that rail is a choice of everyday mobility for people and for the goods. This is the first choice uh, when we want to move to be in this type of direction. And now, how we intend to achieve it? Well, Europe's rail has been established at the beginning of the year. We had a formal launch event uh, on the 21st of February at the presence of Commissioner Valian and also uh, with a message from Commissioner Gabriel and uh, ministers of the member states because it was back to back to a informal uh, me uh, meeting of the minister uh, in the transport uh, organized uh, setup uh, and uh, um, is uh, set up in the in the way of being um, designed exactly to answer this vision and this mission um, identifying the different role of the different type of activities. If we can go to the next slide. Uh, in particular, the organization is structured around uh, the program office, that is the, 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 the organization that is delivering the program, and around three main activities, the system pillar that provides a systemic approach on how rail research innovation will have to move, the innovation pillar that will deliver the components in order to achieve such vision, and the deployment group that will ensure that we deploy the solution, the technological and operational solution that will be uh, uh, coming from the work we do together in the system pillar, in the innovation pillar, is a full integrated program. But what is important in these slides is that Europe's rail is part of a full integrated system, not only in the rail system, but in the overall arching uh, way of working. We have fundamental contacts with the European Agency for Railway because it's the system authority for ETMS for safety and interoperability and the strong connection if you want to see our solution in the market is there. We need to have contacts and we have a strong relation with the standardization body <clears throat> at European Union level and at international level and with the new setup the system pillar steering group we have a strong liaison with the association with the representative of the stakeholders uh, at European Union level in order to have the system evolving. So this is the new structure that we have designed uh, with the objective to, be a, to have an organization capable to federate around itself uh, the sector to deliver. It's a common effort, it's a joint effort, and this is the reason also why we have uh, this call that is set up as a full open call in line with the Horizon Europe rules. Now, <clears throat> we can go more a bit in detail about uh, uh, exactly the call. We entered directly in the, in the call. After Giorgio will come back, as he mentioned, about uh, uh, the program providing a more feedback. We would like to take a few minutes of your attention to go on the key elements of the call. Next, please, Giorgio. The, the message is, it's an open call to all the entities in Europe uh, in accordance with Horizon Europe rule. Uh, and uh, there are no additional conditions. You will see there are some additional conditions if if our member will apply, will uh, submit proposal, will participate to consortia to submit proposal, yes, they will have additional condition. I will explain uh, a bit uh, why, and after the colleagues, Vincent in the afternoon, will explain more in detail the type of conditions. But here, uh, uh, the idea is everyone can participate if he's eligible in accordance with the European uh, Union uh, Horizon Programme rules of participation. Uh, and there are only additional conditions for 
the members if they will be awarded grants, if they apply and if will they be awarded grants. Now we go rapidly uh, through these, uh, these uh, conditions. Well, uh, this is confirmed what I just said. So in terms of admissibility, eligibility, financial award documents procedure, as you can uh, see, we are referring only to the conditions that are defined in Horizon Europe Work Programme 2021-2022. Uh, clearly, uh, these are conditions that are subject also to the evolution in the Horizon uh, Europe program, taking into account also the current situation and the restriction adopted by the European Union uh, with regard to uh, Russian and Belarusian. So uh, this uh, also we need to, to I, will, I wanted to mention because uh, we are referring to them and we need always to keep in eyes how these conditions are evolving also from this point of view. We go now a bit more in detail on the specific uh, uh, condition we have highlighted for the call that are not introducing new condition, but only explaining how the call is constructed, how we have thought about the call. So the first one is that we identify a budget. We expect to fund one proposal per topic unless uh, the, the money would allow uh, to uh, fund more. It depends on the request of the, the, the funding that is put on the table. And one of the key important aspects is that the, about the indicative budget. As I said, uh, the, the, in terms of indicative budget, if the member will be participating and applying, if the member will be awarded the grant, they will not only to give to us the uh, normal um, uh, activities foreseen in the action, but they need to ensure that the total value of their investment is 1.263 times additional to the funding they receive. But this is only for the member, not for anyone else. So this is a condition that applied to the member of the, the JU. Next, please. In terms of, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, next, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, perfectly. Uh, TRL uh, level, we are targeting, and this is an important other message, we are targeting on high TRL level. We are in this, uh, uh, we are uh, targeting five to seven. In some, we are targeting eight to nine. Because the, this is an example, why? Because we want to ensure that we deliver impact after the next four years. So 2022, 26, we want to deliver impact. We want to have results that can start the journey to enter in the pipeline of the regulatory framework. In terms of uh, admissibility condition, as we mentioned, there are already the, uh, the one defined in the Horizon Europe condition. The only we have made an exception to enlarge the number of pages to up to 120 pages for the application, because we want uh, to be sure that uh, such an important call, such of uh, important call of such a magnitude require a bit more information to ensure a proper and adequate evaluation. In terms of skills and competencies, we need the skill and competencies of the rail sector and beyond. We need to have the skill and competencies from the rail infrastructure manager because we want to have a network that is available theoretically and as a target 24-7, um, but especially we want to have a digital network. We want to, to, to and I think we'll go through it through the sustainable assets part of the of the call. We want to have the input from the rail suppliers uh, because <clears throat> We need to be sure uh, that the uh, supply industry is ready and uh, to bring its know-how inside to develop the new technological and operational solution. We need to have the view of the railway undertakings that are capturing the clients, would be clients for the supply chain or clients of, or, or the passenger. We need to have the expertise from the research institute ac academia in order to, to bring inside the, the latest knowledge that we have. And uh, we need to have also additional expertise inside the, 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 the proposal uh, from other sector, maybe from uh, aviation, maybe from uh, energy, from other solution. We need to have, uh, uh, we will link the projects together in a form of program. Please go ahead, George, uh, in, in, in a program. So all our activities will be linked between themselves because they are interdependencies. And you will see, if you look at the multi-annual work program, the type of interdependency we have identified. Uh, we also already anticipated because uh, the ambitious is, as I said, in the next four years to deliver a major results to allow and we announce it the early start date of the project. So if you intend to start before at your risk, the activities uh, uh, clearly you can. And once the grants agreement will be ready for signature, it will be uh, um, 
uh, introduced in the grant agreement. But we already announced, so you are already aware that we have already taken this position clearly in a manner that to accelerate the ramp up phase of the project without waiting the final signature. So the full process of grant uh, uh, preparation phase and signature that will take maybe a few months before it's completed. Next, please. Now, we are using in Europe's rail, like in shift to rail, as we were the first organization in the European Union to use the lump sum grant together with the Commission, we will continue the approach towards lump sum grant. We want to focus on results. We want to focus on delivered impact. We are not focusing on counting how you book your uh, 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 travel, uh, how you spend your money in, in journeys, or how you calculate your hours. We are focusing on the results. Yes, Vincent will show to you at the moment into which you submit the proposal, you need to keep in mind the reference elements of the criteria used. But once you start the activities, you will not be asked to keep record of the timesheet in accordance with the rules that Horizon Europe and so on and so on, there will be no ex post financial audits. Yes, we may come to assess your results. We may come to understand if we have the results, but our focus is the results. Our focus is to ensure European passenger in the future will travel in a different manner. And logically the cargo. Now, funding rate is a quite a, a touchy topic, I know. Uh, because uh, clearly uh, when we announced that we have a flat, flat rate, uh, funding rate of 60% for our actions that are innovation actions due to the fact that the IRL is uh, targeting 789 uh, in, in largely. Um, so, and second, why 60%? Because it's uh, the, it required by the single basic act. So the legislation underpinning the joint undertaking is regulation 2020, uh, 2085, 2021. So look at it. Um, and there is article in the numbers uh, uh, between uh, 80 and 90 dedicated specifically to Europe's rail. We need to deliver uh, for 600 million euros funding, 600 million euros at least of contribution. So for each euro invested by Europe's rail, we need to have two euros minimum of um, additional activity realized. So meaning that we uh, and the single basic act foresee that the JUs uh, need to reduce the funding rate to create such type of approach. So we have decided to have a funding rate that is 60 percent, but each consortia may decide internally to apply the funding rate of Article 34 Horizon Europe. So to uh, fund, for example, to decide to, to fund the um, uh, research center, the university at 100%, like it's foreseen, so the non-profit organization. So each consortia should decide to have inside different funding rate in accordance with Article 34, up to when the total funding rate, so the total request of funding comes to 60%. This is really an important. So also from this point of view, we have heard the request of the sector. We try to find the solution to answer it while keeping the boundaries that are fixed in the single basic act. I know that uh, uh, 60 percent is uh, and to be clear. If a member of Europe's rail is awarded a grant, he will not receive 60 percent. They will not receive 60 percent. They will receive 45 percent. Because effectively, they will have to do this famous contribution, the 1.263 that we discussed before. OK, so for the in member, if it will be uh, uh, awarded a grant, it will be only 45 percent and they will have also to contribute to the running cost of the JU. In terms of a work criteria, Giorgio and the colleagues will explain later, we use the work criteria of Horizon Europe, but we have added a couple of criteria to show that we are running an integrated program. So we'll value also the way of working, the way of working together, way of working jointly to deliver the solution, because we want to have interoperable by design solution. Yes, we ask you also to contribute to the overall dissemination of the program. We want to have an impact also from the communication and dissemination point of view. We need to be sure that in all this, uh, what we do, we pass the message that we are working together. We are working together to deliver the change. Uh, Casey, I mentioned before, we need to have the uh, unity to change the sys system. And this is really where we need to, we have also the strengths of the, the joint undertaking. Next, please. And after I will go to Giorgio, before concluding, 
only few words from my side on top of, of let's say, the, the event itself. First of all, let me thank all the colleagues that have been involved uh, in this process, uh, the sector, the rail association, uh, and in particular the commission for the effort that uh, uh, took uh, to hold to be at this point in time to launch a call on the 10th of March. Well, you know that we have uh, uh, the Europe's Rail started, legally speaking, on the 30th of November. So we were able in, in three months almost uh, realize all these major uh, results. So thank you to all. And a thought to all the people that uh, um, in Ukraine are suffering uh, from the violence and the nonsense of what is going on there. Um, I want to mention it because uh, uh, this is something that uh, uh, I think uh, um, requires our respect and our uh, humble, uh, I would say, attention uh, in what we can do. Um, I hope that also the work we will be doing in uh, rare research innovation um, will help to, to create a stronger and unite Europe, as Christian said, uh, bringing together the uh, inheritance, uh, the cultural inheritance of Europe. Uh, but as I said, our thought also to the people there, because I don't think for any of them is, uh, is, uh, is absolutely easy. But also a major thanks to all the European rail operators that showed uh, the capacity uh, to welcome the, uh, uh, the, the million of people that crossed the border with the European Union from Ukraine, uh, uh, offering opportunities for travel uh, to, the, their can to other countries, uh, maybe to their families uh, for free. So this is, uh, I think, there is a major effort from the rail system. Once again, the rail system has shown the strength of being capable to work together and to deliver uh, also from this point of view. Thank you very much to all. Uh, now we will enter more in detail of the call, uh, the program, and the specific text of the call. Uh, and uh, um, I give the floor back to Giorgio, who is uh, the uh, metro of, 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 of today. Thank you, Giorgio. Thank you, Carlo. Uh, so let's go back to the presentation mode. Uh, I think you can see the screen. So I will present to you a bit uh, how to navigate in this uh, uh, endeavor, which is the uh, Europe's Rail Joint Undertaking, and in particular the program, because uh, as Carlo mentioned, it is an integrated program and we want to have a system approach, and all of this is depicted in different uh, documents. And I think also it's important for you not only to understand the concept of the program, but also to understand uh, which document uh, is saying what. And so I will uh, try to explain to you the program through this. The regulation is uh, uh, what uh, we referred, Carlo referred before with uh, the name a single basic act. So it defines uh, all the uh, rules of the game, let me say, and uh, it defines also the existence of the joint undertaking and its program itself. But the program content in it start with the master plan. So the master plan, it's publicly available on our website. We are referring to it uh, in the topic of the call text. And uh, uh, it's uh, a, a forward looking uh, roadmap and document that present in a system view the areas of priorities in terms of research and innovation. And these will be the areas of priorities of the joint undertaking for the next 10 years. It gives a guidance, so it is a guidance document on how we're going to invest the 1.2 billion that we have uh, for this ambitious program. It also defines the ambition itself, and it explains that um, it will be based, the core of the program will be based on two integrated pillars, the system and innovation pillar, complemented by a deployment group. And I will go later on into the detail of uh, those uh, topics. So here you have uh, a nice picture that uh, is uh, trying, let me say, to summarize uh, the master plan. But uh, again, I suggest that in any case you have a read of the master plan. It's not a boring document. It's actually quite, uh, quite interesting. And it, it starts to define what are the priorities of the union and what is the priorities of the sector. So let's remember this is a public-private partnership. And we were able, through the master plan, to make these uh, strong connection between uh, the two worlds, the public and the private. And uh, what we want to do is to deliver a European railway network, uh, a European railway system that is 
uh, working as a one that is reliable, resilient, that is competitive, and uh, that also helps to enhance the competitiveness of the rail industry. And you can see we have the system pillar, innovation pillar, and deployment group as key body of or key uh, structure of an integrated research and innovation program. Each of them have a different uh, uh, role, and uh, uh, but they need to work together. I will present later on into the better detail this uh, this uh, role, uh, but just to highlight that the system pillar it's really a novelty of uh, Europe's rate, and it's the first time the race sector it's actually agreeing to have a single coordinating body for the entire sector evolution. That true rail and research innovation will actually make a change in the system. So we're really going up into the ladder, ladder of research and innovation and closing the gap up until the deployment. In the innovation part, we are clearly structuring in uh, future solutions that, uh, so in research and innovation activities that will deliver solution. And for this, we have, um, let me say, push the concept also uh, referred into the regulation of a flagship project that will lead into large scale demonstration uh, around mainly five areas of research and innovation activities that you can see there on the screen. And later on, we will detail more how we have a thought to implement those uh, five different areas. And of course, uh, we don't forget the fact that we need to have constant innovation, even though we are bringing up the ladder of TRL, we need also to look into exploratory and fundamental research and innovation and the new ideas that can actually um, bring a, a significant disruption and the change on top of what, of course, we also think will bring in any case a big, a big impact. So the key word uh, of the master plan, it's really the impact. And for this reason, we have really focused on uh, seven impact that this program needs to deliver. And these impact have been quantified. It has been quantified both in the master plan and in the later document, which will become, let me say, more relevant for the call itself. But the idea is really that we are going to deliver according to those uh, seven impact. So it's uh, not a program of, uh, um, let me say, uh, open uh, ambitions, but it's a program with clearly defined ambitions and uh, uh, looking into, into providing impact. So now going back to the documents themselves, uh, the next level is the multi-annual work program. The multi-annual work program is a fundamental document for the call because uh, it defined the RNI activities in terms of uh, content and structures that are foreseen for the next uh, 10 years. Of course, it's a living document, so it will be subject to update. But for the moment, you already have a picture of how we foresee the research and innovation activities evolving and to be especially implemented. So it defines what to do in the system pillar, what to do in the innovation pillar, and it will define also what to do in the deployment group. Starting with the system pillar activities, and I think uh, this is also uh, interesting for you to, to understand a picture about it, because all the uh, research and innovation activities, as I mentioned, are connected. So also the topic of this call make reference to the fact that uh, the future project will need to collaborate with the system innovation uh, system pillar activities and actually provide the input to that and also, of course, uh, um, implementing the output uh, of the system pillar. What are the outputs of the system pillar? It is at the moment the structure around the two tasks that are also uh, there for, of course, uh, subject to possible evolution and additional tasks. But for the moment, the two tasks identified is one to define a system architecture for the entire rail system. So making sure that we actually are achieving a single European railway in area, which is competitive, which is uh, synchronized in terms of deployment and aligned to the future. So that is innovation friendly. 
And actually, this is something that due to the long life cycle of the uh, railer sector, as you all know, from, and also the, uh, let, well, let me say, the, the, the non-aligned approach across different regions and countries, we are taking much, much more time to implement innovation than other sectors. Then the task two is to look already concretely into the developing of what we're calling a CCS plus system. So uh, this uh, con control command system is looking into the architecture of the signaling communication, but also linking between the different subsystem and making sure that we have one single approach in Europe also in the different separation of what is a safety and non safety related. Of course, what is all safety related, as Carlo already mentioned, it's uh, the European Union Agency, which is the uh, authority on the matter. But we would like to push it forward and going into also the non safety related to have a common European approach. This will guide us to common migration strategy that we will need to implement for the defined operational concept and of course input to the TSI for the agency, but also input to standards, European standards, harmonized standards that are derived for, from the different aspects not covered into the TSI. And then we are looking into the um, uh, innovation part of the, um, of the program which is about implementing the five research innovation areas that you have seen defined before in the master plan. And uh, we looked into a concrete way to do this, and uh, we actually identified seven flagship area and one transversal topic, plus of course the exploratory research and other activities that we will continue to do. Those are flagship areas significantly differ from um, what shift to rail had done before in the previous program, because are, are clearly an integrated set of activities that will deliver an integrated demonstration. And because of this integration, you have these seven flagship areas, so a really big program of research and innovation activities. And because of this uh, ability, not only to look into the subsystem, but already at system level, the interconnection between of the flag, all the flagship area become even more relevant than what was in shift to rate. Of course, this is a complexity from a research and innovation perspective, but we are there also to manage this complexity. And uh, I think it's a nice challenge for all of you also to take it up. And uh, it's a challenge that we believe will bring a significant impact as explained before. I will not go into the detail of explaining the flagship area also in the interest of time, because later on my colleagues will present to you the topic call, which we call destination, that are largely based on the six first flagship area plus the transversal topic. The only additional flagship area which is not covered in this uh, first call, it is the flagship area seven, uh, which it's about a new approach it, for guided transport mode, so to explore non-traditional and emerging high-speed guided transport mode, and as well as to create opportunities for innovators to bring new ideas into the rail system and shape its future. Together with this, of course, it comes the exploratory research that will also that is also not part of this first call, but will be part of the second call as well. Uh, that will bring uh, the further element of innovations that uh, uh, we are expecting at a lower TRL, of course. Uh, but you can see on those uh, seven flagship area that in any case, we are covering all the major topics of the rail sector, of the rail system, and uh, we believe that those are the ones that will bring a, ma a major impact uh, in Europe. How the multi-annual work program it is implemented? It is implemented uh, through calls, as you know, calls for tender or calls for proposal. And so going to concrete, the for the system pillar, we will implement a true call for tender. And the first call for tender, as you can see in our annual work plan, is expected to be launched in the first quarter of 2022. So very soon. Uh, the innovation pillar activities, 
uh, they are they constitute of course the core of the program in terms of research and innovation and is also where we expect the contribution of the member to reach uh, 576 million euros as explained by Carlo before in terms of contribution to this uh, public private partnership. The first call has been already published as you know today we have the info day and this call uh, it's important for you to understand is covering 50% of the research and innovation activity described in the multi-annual uh, work program. And as I explained, it covers the six flagship area and the TT. The call uh, will continue this, uh, um, uh, let me say, this uh, core part of the program, those uh, six flagship area plus the TT, will continue and are expected to be covered with a second series of calls or a second wave, if you want, around 2025-2026, expecting covering the other 30%, and then in 2027, covering the rest that needs to be uh, performed in order to close the RNI cycle and arrive to the expected TRL level uh, that uh, and the ambition that is written in the multi-annual work program. In addition, as I mentioned, we will launch on a regular basis call for proposal for new research areas and also including the FA7. And the next call, the second call of this year, will be published this year on the Q3 of, the, of, of this year. So we will have for sure another info day for this. But so stay tuned also on our website, subscribe to the newsletter because there will be a new call for lower TRL activities. Um, launch this year. And then the deployment group, uh, maybe it's a bit soon to discuss about its implementation, but as soon as we will have the results uh, based on the evolution of the program, uh, also the activities of the deployment group will be further defined. And to conclude, the annual work program is setting up the activities that the JU will undertake annually to implement that. And the annual work program that today is published 2022-2024, as you can see, is covering a significant part of budget, as I explained, for the first call, which is covering 50% of the FA uh, values. And uh, we will launch this uh, second call in Q3 of about uh, 12.5 million euros of uh, European uh, co-funding money. As you can see here, we are expecting not to have uh, a significant increase in the value of the action as it is before, because the funding rate, it will be much more aligned to uh, the normal funding rate of Horizon Europe. So it will not be the 60%. And then the call for tender. Uh, you can see also here a picture of uh, the budget foreseen for the, the first years. Uh, you can see all the implementation in the annual work plan. Now, going to the content of the call before giving the floor to my colleagues, you can see uh, the different uh, six topics that we have launched uh, this uh, March, so the 10th of March, and uh, uh, the call is open, it's open for submission. The deadline is the 23rd of June. Please be sure to respect the deadline. If uh, you don't meet uh, the deadline, it's 5 p.m. And if you don't meet uh, the deadline, your proposal will be disregarded. And also you can see here key information also in uh, the destination topic. So the name of the topic, we call it destination. So we have destination one, two, three, four, five, six. But the coding of the topics, you can see which flagship area is referring to. You can see destination one, I think it's quite obvious it's about flagship area one, but it also integrate inside the same topic, the transversal topic activities. Flagship area two, it's destination two and so on and so forth. Carlo already mentioned we're targeting ITRL. You can see here the different TRL uh, that we're targeting for each of the flagship area. And of course the budget. Something important be before going into the content itself, it's about the structure. So the structure starts with a description of the destination, which is about the description of the objectives with clear quantified target in terms of key performance indicator to be reached with the research and innovation activities. 
This is a key point because we are impact oriented, so we are expecting that each project will be able to monitor its own KPI, and for this reason we have defined a set of KPIs to be demonstrated or to be assessed with the demonstration activities the projects will be conducted. The expected outcome uh, section, it describes, uh, of course, what are the expected demonstration, but also the expected preparatory works to be launched for future demonstration for the second wave, a third wave that we have uh, foreseen in the multi-annual work program. So to a lower TRL, but preparatory activities. And also something important, one of the conditions that Carlo already mentioned before is that we have linked the different actions, so the different future projects between themselves. And uh, there is an expectation of input output between the different uh, uh, projects. Uh, and all of this is described in detail inside the topics. The scope section identify what are the expected capabilities or the expected enablers in terms of new functions that will need to be developed through research and innovation activities, and then will need to be demonstrated, of course, in the demonstration that we described before. It also highlights the fact, as I mentioned before, that we need, the, well, you will need to ensure the measuring and the monitor of the KPI we have defined in the cold topic text, but also that we are expecting that the research and innovation activities will actively contribute to standards and TSI. So the research output need already to embed these into their program and uh, also that resources needs to be foreseen in order to all not only do this, but also to interact with the system pillar activities that I have explained to you before. So all of this, of course, is described in detail in the topic text. With this, I conclude my quite long, unfortunately, uh, presentation.